Welcome everyone. So glad you're joining us today on Tuesday, gosh, July 2nd in the afternoon for Understanding a Stitch Part 2 with Debbie Katsumani. Before I turn this over to Debbie, and my name is Jeannie Delpit, I'll be your host for the afternoon, I want to share a few things. As you see on the bottom of Debbie's slides, there are no handouts for this session. And as you might have heard as you entered, you are in listen-only mode. Should you have a question, please feel free to type it. You should see a little box to the right on your screen. Just type in your question. I'll have a questions bar open. On the I probably won't reply to your questions as I'll save quite a few for Debbie to address at the end of the presentation. So type your questions in, sit back. You are in for an absolute delightful afternoon. Glad you're here. Debbie, take it away, my friend. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Debbie, and this is Understanding a Stitch Part 2. It is um, a follow-up to last week's lesson. Uh, last week was more about the mechanics of how a stitch is created. This week, it's more about the things you can control uh, by setting your machine up the way that fits your project. So let's get started. So we're going to work on fine-tuning your stitch with machine settings. We're going to talk a little bit about using the correct presser foot. And we're going to talk a little bit about creating new stitches just because you can. A lot of this has to do with a, a feature that Bernina offers you that's called total stitch control. Because Bernina does not uh, control what you do with your stitches. You can do anything you want with them. Um, and they um, they do not limit you in what you can do. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is top thread tension, because that does affect how your stitch will look. Your top thread tension is at the top of your machine, right in the front before you bring your thread down around the take-up lever. We talked about take-up lever last week. Underneath the case of the machine, it looks like this in the yellow box and the yellow circle. You see those couple of metal, um, um, they're actually discs that, that uh, move together and apart depending on what you're doing. So if I raise my presser foot, my tension discs move away from each other. And that allows the thread to pass evenly. And if you pulled your thread through the needle, it would pull easily with your presser foot up. If you put your presser foot down, there should be tension on your thread, which means if you pull that thread down by your needle, you should feel a little bit of resistance there. You can pull a little bit, but it's, it really should hold you back. So that top thread tension is really important. And when you thread your machine, you should always thread your machine with your presser foot up. If you have the manual presser foot up and down on the back of the machine, raise it up, Thread the, thread the machine and make sure that you kind of hold your thread like you're flossing your teeth. Pull it down in those tension discs that you see there. Pull it down until you come down the way down, up through the take up bar and back down again. Then you can kind of relax and go ahead and thread the needle. If you have a machine that has the automatic presser foot up and down and you start to thread your machine, the machine kind of knows what to do and you just let it do its thing. Each stitch is created with its own default tension. It's preset at the factory. The tension of each stitch can be changed without affecting any other stitches. And this is true with all of our touch screen models. Each stitch will have its own top tension. So if you chose a straight stitch and you looked at the top tension and then you chose a zigzag, the top tension number that you see on the screen would not necessarily be the same number. And that's because those are all preset at the factory. When you change one or the other, it does not affect the other one. So I did a uh, stitch out sample just to show you how this affects what your stitch might look like. And I, uh, this is a forced example. I used top thread was white, bottom thread was black and I increased my top tension like way up so that my top thread was holding back, pulling the bobbin thread up. So when your tension is tighter, meaning a higher number on the value of the, on the screen, 
when that number is a higher number, it makes the two tension discs closer together and holds back the thread from flowing down to create your stitch. It, it does not allow as much thread to pass through the tension discs. And so that will pull your bobbin thread up to the top. So if you see something like this on your fabric and you didn't intend it to look this way, then your option would be to lower your top tension from default and let that thread pass um, through the tension disc easier and drop a little lower so that you don't see your bobbin thread pulling to the top. So how do I change my top tension? On a touchscreen model, you will touch this icon at the very top left of your screen. And it is a white to um, gray color number, and that is the default. If you change it, then it would change. The color of the, of the um, box there would turn yellow, and the number that you see at the top left is also yellow. And that reminds you that, oh, I've changed my top tension here. The way to change it is you can use the plus minus signs on either side of the yellow box. You can use that radio dot that you see down below and just drag it up and down, or you can use your multifunction knob. So there are three ways to do the same thing. Bernina gives you lots of choices, like I said. So three ways to do the same thing. Pick one that makes you happy. It doesn't matter which one you choose. They all do the same thing. If you choose to um, go back to default, you would just touch that yellow box and it would clear that to default. So I popped a picture here of a three series machine. The three series machines do not have a touch screen. And so they do not have the options that you see at the bottom of the screen. They have a tension dial at the top that um, is manual. And there's a red line on it, and you match it to the you match the dot to the red line, and that's the default tension. On those machines, the when you change the top tension, it affects all the stitches in the machine, not just the one that you are working on today. The next thing we're going to talk about are the stitch plates. So stitch plates are really important, and you should always use the correct stitch plate for straight stitches versus wider stitches, and I'll, I'll explain more of that in a minute. You also should, on touchscreen models, tell the machine which stitch plate you are choosing to use today. It is a security function so you don't break your needle. So down here at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a bank of options that are stitch plate choices. The one here on the left is a nine millimeter stitch plate. And you will only see that one on machines that are nine millimeter optional. The next one is a 5.5 millimeter. And you can use a 5.5 millimeter uh, stitch plate on a nine millimeter machine if you were going to do, uh, for example, like a narrow um, satin stitch applique. And you didn't want all that extra stitch width because your stitches are more accurate if you use a smaller stitch plate based upon the stitch that you're using. I'll get to that in a second. This third one here in the middle is zero millimeter stitch plate, which is your straight stitch plate. Some of our machines do have straight stitch plates in the box with your machine purchase, and some do not, but they uh, you can buy those as an accessory. Uh, so here's the way this works. You remember last week when we learned about how the stitch is create, created, right? Needle drops below the stitch plate, loop is formed on the back side of the needle, hook comes around and grabs that loop. So if I have a zero millimeter stitch plate, the needle can only go in one place. It goes straight down and straight back up. There's no possibility for flexing or bending or, or anything weird happening. And that gives you a more precise straight stitch, okay? The other reason is because, it, let's say I'm using a nine millimeter stitch plate, and if, if my nine millimeter stitch plate is like this, then when the hook comes around to grab that thread, there's some play there. There could be some play there. And if I were doing just a straight stitch, if I am using a, 
a zero millimeter stitch plate, a straight stitch plate, that the stitch plate itself forces the thread through one point. And that will make your straight stitches more precise than not. Not that they aren't in a nine millimeter stitch plate, but some of us are, and I'm speaking about myself, annoyingly precise, and I want it to be exactly this way. And that's how I make that happen. The two other stitch plates that you see in this uh, bank of uh, stitch plates are for needle punch and cut work. And those are accessory options that we're not gonna get into today. But I wanna say one more thing about um, the stitch plates. If you are using a, let's say you're doing free motion and you're using the Bernina stitch regulator and you're, you have a straight stitch selected and let's say you leave your nine millimeter stitch plate on just because you forgot to put it on the zero one and you start pushing your fabric around and you're doing your free motion and all of a sudden you might see like a skip stitch or a loops. Um, those can happen because if you're using that nine millimeter stitch plate and you're pushing your fabric against your needle, it's just a needle, it's not that strong, it could flex just a little bit and then it would be out of position when it drops below that stitch plate. And you know already, cause you were here last week with me, you know already that the distance from the needle to the hook is only 0.05 millimeters, which is a teeny weeny space. And if you push that needle and it flexes just a little bit, it, the hook might not catch the loop because your needle is not in the right position. So straight stitching means use a straight stitch plate and don't forget to tell the machine you're using it. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about are Bernina presser feet. There are almost 100 Bernina uh, presser feet and there, there's one for like every imaginable uh, sewing technique out there. And yet they still find reasons to make more for us. Each one is hand tooled and hand polished and tested before it goes in a box for, for us to use them. And when I say hand polished, I mean a person actually buffs the inside where the needle drops to make sure that there are no burrs or any scratches on the foot um, uh, as they go through the manufacturing process. Um, they wanna make sure they're nice and polished on the inside to make sure that your uh, threads don't rip or, or break. They all are a one piece presser feet. So they have that clip on attachment so you don't have to use any screwdrivers. So they're full shank feet. And you can find Bernina presser feet videos on bernina.com or on YouTube. And this is just a screen capture that I, I grabbed off of YouTube. Uh, this is one of my favorite feet, the 34C. It's got a clear bottom and red crosshairs on it. So I can see right through it and I can see exactly where I'm going. And I really like the 34, uh, number 34 foot. So the other way you can find out about presser feet are through the big book of feet. And the big book of feet is, I don't know, more than 200 pages, full color, the left side of the page um, has a, a big picture of samples that that particular foot would um, create for you, a description of what it does. And then the opposite page has a picture of the feet in that family of feet. And then it explains to you why the bottom of the presser feet is, is made the way that it is. And you have to understand, just like last week, we talked about why things are made the way they are are really important. And the bottom of the foot is actually more important than the top most of the time, because that's the part that holds your fabric down. So that's really important. At the bottom of that page on the right that you can see is a box, and it tells you how to set up your machine for the techniques that are listed. The following couple pages will dive into a little more detail, more pictures, things like that that tell you how to use those presser feet. Here's the thing. These are in the book in numerical order, number one through you know 90 something. And so how do you know which one you need based upon your technique? I've got the answer. So there's a part in the book in the back. It's called the Accessory and Technique Index. And in this index, it gives you the presser feet that are for certain techniques. So I've circled here the in red, 
the binding feet. So it gives you all the choices that you could use to bind a quilt. And then this one says, oh, these are all couching feet. And there are lots of choices in here. You just have to figure out what works for the technique you're using. So sometimes we have to study and learn a little bit so we know what we need. Also, don't forget your Bernina dealer will help you with all of these things. Total stitch control. I've said these words before more than once, and this is really important. So you'll see I have a big ruler on the screen. I'll get to that in a minute, just hang tight. This whole page is about stitch length and stitch width. These are things that are easy to change and definitely have an effect on how your stitch is going to look. So your stitch length can be changed by 0.05 millimeter increments, which is a teeny weeny space. I'll show you that in a minute on our ruler. The stitch width can be changed by 0.1 millimeter increments. You can change any stitch to fit your project and you can change decorative stitches, practical stitches and sideways motion stitches as well. So let's get to that ruler. At the bottom of the ruler, you'll see a one inch mark. At the top, where I just pulled the arrow up, that is one centimeter. And one inch equals about 2.5, two and a half centimeters. This arrow is pointing to one millimeter from the number one mark to the next line is one millimeter. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time wrapping my head around things like 0.05 millimeters. That's five one hundredths of that tiny little space. And that's the kind of um, detail and control that you have over your stitches that it's just amazing to me that that is a thing. Just have a hard time imagining that kind of space. It's not very big but it does give you a lot of control on how you can use your stitches and prepare them for what you want to do. At the bottom of the screen is a picture of, um, a, a screen capture of where you would, when you would change your stitch length and width on your touch screens, you'll see that those numbers turn yellow. And they, when they turn yellow, and um, that means that it kind of reminds you that, oh, you've made a change. But know that if you went and did other stitches and came back to this one, it would still remember these settings, these stitch length and width settings and, and other settings. That's called the temporary altered stitch memory. It's, it's um, what I love, uh, there are, uh, here's what I love about it. I love the fact that I can set up one stitch and set up a second and maybe a third and I can toggle between them and back and forth and I never have to reset them because they, it, the machine remembers it. It's a temporary memory. Yes, when you shut your machine off, they all go back to factory preset unless you've saved them. But that's a nice way to work through a whole sewing session and toggle between different stitches and you don't have to reset your stitches. So the next thing I want to talk about is how much your stitch length really does matter. So I, I, I had a hard time trying to figure out how I could graphically show this to you. So let's see if this works. On the left side of the screen, you'll see a blue box that's narrow. And on the right side, you'll see a blue box that's um, wider. So on the left side, let's imagine that that's two layers of fabric, like I'm piecing. So two layers of cotton, right? The depth of those two layers is not very deep. So when I choose my stitch for piecing, I might choose a 2.0 stitch length or a 1.9 stitch length, whatever I prefer, because I don't need a lot of thread to get through the depth of two layers of cotton. But on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see what I imagine as like, if I were doing a purse or a bag or something with some depth to it, some thickness to it, that I would put multiple layers underneath the foot and, it, and it's deeper. And you what I want you to kind of grasp is that you need more thread in the thread path to manage the depth of what you're sewing through. 
And if you have a 2.0 or 1.9 stitch length on multiple layers that are thicker, then your stitch may look, um, it may look crinkled a little bit. It may wing one way or the other because there's not enough thread in the path of the stitch that would allow for the depth of the layers. So if you're sewing on two layers of cotton, a short stitch length is just fine. If you're sewing on deeper layers, then you're going to need to increase your stitch length based upon what you see when you sew. So do a test sew. If you're working on a purse or bag and you're about ready to put all that stuff under the foot, then get, grab a couple of scraps, put it under there about the same thickness and, and see what it looks like. If it looks like your fabric is pinched, then longer stitch length is the answer. And I would, you know, go to at least a 3.0 stitch length. You could go a little bigger. You don't want to go as far as basting. So there's a range there and you're going to have to test so to figure out what works for your project that day. Another thing about stitch length that I want you to understand for those of you who have the machines with a touch screen is that if you choose a decorative stitch, the decorative stitches often come up on as the stitch length on the left side of the screen in the yellow circle. Those come up as um, the pattern length. So that would be on this particular stitch, it would be from the beginning to the end of the stitch. On this one, it would be point to point. Some stitches don't have points, but you know, from the first um, needle penetration to the last needle penetration that it would complete that full stitch sequence. That 17.9 you see in that circle is the whole pattern length. So 17.9 is, you know, maybe about a half an inch, a little more in length. Okay. If I want to know what is my actual stitch length, so that particular one is a satin stitch. If I want to know what my actual stitch length is, then I touch the number that says 17.9 and this box on the right will open and that will tell me the actual stitch length of 0.35. So just so you know what those two different numbers mean. One is actual stitch length and the other one is pattern length. Well, this is one of my favorite things, presser foot pressure. I adjust this every time I sew. And let me tell you what I mean. Presser foot pressure means that the amount of pressure being pushed down on your fabric by your presser foot has a numerical value. And the harder it presses, the more your fabric may stretch. And the lighter it gets off of your fabric, the less it will make your fabric stretch. This feature on your machine literally um, raises the foot off the bed of the machine, gives it more space underneath so it's not pushing down so hard. So if I'm, if I'm using two layers of fabric, I would need a different presser foot pressure than if I were using multiple layers of fabric. Maybe I need it to give it a little more space under the foot. But there are other reasons because stretching of your fabric is a problem for us, it, it, for me, <laughs> especially things like when I'm piecing, because I'm, you know, I can be annoying and I really want my points to match when I want my quilt points to match. And, you know, this feature helps my points match. Let me show you what I mean. Oh, another couple um, details before we get into that. The uh, B570 Quilters Edition and higher in the line, so that would be 597 Series 8 Series, have numerical. Um, selections on your screen for presser foot pressure. The 535 and the 4 series have a manual dial that's on the left side of the head of the machine. It's not it's not numerical. It's um it's a low to high, heavy to light and you have to test so just like everything else, you have to test so to figure out what it is that's going to make you happy based upon what you see. And the 3 series does not offer presser foot pressure. So Here's the way it works. If my presser foot is down on my fabric and it's too, it's pushing too heavy, then 
I would see a snow plow in front of my fab in front of my presser foot. See that bump of fabric there? That um, that happens when your top layer of fabric is is has too much uh, the foot is too much pressure and it's literally stretching the top layer and it's pushing the fabric forward and you don't ever want to see that because that means your points will definitely not match i'm just saying if you look behind the foot and you see the red i used red thread on purpose so you could see it see the red um the bubble of fabric behind the foot so none of this is a good look um Presser foot pressure is a very important feature for you to consider pretty much every time you sew. This next picture shows you that I have changed my presser foot pressure. I've made it a lower number on the screen. I've chosen to drop the pressure, drop the pressure, presser foot pressure, and that means my foot is up, up a little bit off the bed of my machine. I've also decided to use my dual feed. But those of you that have a Bernina dual feed um, foot, when you if you see stretching of your fabric, then the dual feed will help you um, help you with that because it helps keep your top and your bottom layer even. It moves your two layers. Um, it, the dual feed foot moves the exact same speed as your lower feed dogs. So as your feed dogs are pulling your top, your dual feed foot is pulling at the same speed. So that should keep everything nice and even, right? And so you see behind the foot now, my seam is now flat and even. And it, isn't that just like the most happy, beautiful, wonderful, heartwarming thing you can think of in life is to have a beautiful seam. So know that on, um, for those of you that have the eight series machine, the eight series machine has a um, speed control on your dual feed that you can increase or decrease the speed of your dual feed foot. And it what that means is it could pull your top layer a little faster or a little slower than your lower feed dogs. It's it's really like a fine tune, a fine tuning opportunity for those of us who choose to use it. So you can see there's no snow plow and the seam is flat and even. So press the foot pressure, it's not. It, it affects your stitching. It doesn't affect your actual stitch, but it does affect how things end up. So I want you to be aware of that feature. So I'm going to switch to my Bernina simulator and that will give us the opportunity. Whoops. Hold on. Let's go to um nope let's go to this one okay Jeannie can they see my simulator is that all right yes ma'am okay thank you all right so I'm just going to roll through a couple of things that I think are you know ridiculous fun so um first things we're going to point out some of the things we just talked about up here is your top tension. So when you select it, an overlay window opens and you can just change this whatever way you want and you can hit the yellow box or there's a CLR for clear here at the bottom right that you can use that as well to uh, take any function back to factory preset. The next thing to mention is your presser foot pressure which is this icon, oops, hold on one more second. I'm gonna turn on this highlighter on my cursor so you can see it better. There, that should help. See this icon right here? It is a picture of a presser foot with a weight on the toe. And that is the standard across all of our machines as far as, you know, that's presser foot pressure. If I drop this down, I it makes it less pressure, raising it up for heavier pressure. So if I'm using my, um, uh, so, uh, you know, organza fabric or something very, very lightweight, I might need a heavier pressure, presser foot pressure to hold it down because it's very slinky and um, soft. If I'm, if I'm using, uh, if I'm piecing, personally, this number goes down to 25. That's not a Bernina thing, it's a me thing, just so you know. Uh, let's see. Um, 
here's your stitch plate choices here on the left hand side so these are all setups and if you choose your zero stitch plate know that if you choose the, the uh, straight stitch plate if you then went to your machine and chose a zigzag it would look like a straight stitch because the machine would not allow you to break your needle very important security function so i have a list here let me check my list i just want to make sure i don't forget to show you some things oh i want to talk about securing functions this is a um securing functions are uh like a, a knot a lock stitch a securing function people use different words for the same thing and that feature is here um, on this machine it's here there's a picture of a knot on a button on some machines it's down here um, at the bottom and on on some machines it's here under the information but if it's a picture of a knot that means if I tap it, it will give me a knot and then it will continue to sew, okay? So that's something you can, if you need to secure something at the end of a decorative stitch, then that would be the easy way to do that. There are other ways to do the same thing. Under your gears over here on the right side of your machine, and the next selection would be the sewing stitches here at the top left. This button right here, there you see the knot again. See the needle with the knot or the securing function? So the, here's the thing. If you start sewing and this is turned on like you see it on my screen. If you start sewing any stitch, the machine will give you a four or five lock stitches in one place and then start your stitch. So the question becomes, do you want that to happen? Some people don't want a knot at the beginning of their stitch. In that case, you would turn it off here like that. But let's say, for example, you might be one of those people who starts sewing off the edge of the fabric and drives into the fabric. I'm not one of those. I'm a sew in the fabric that's the way you're supposed to do it. But, you know, people start off the edge. Well, if you start off the edge, that's fine. And you have this knot turned on here and the knot is formed. Like take a couple pieces of thread, tie a knot and throw it under your stitch plate. Where does it go? Oh, into your hook. Well, that could be a challenge, right? What if it gets stuck in your hook? And sometimes it does. So, if your thread, if you do an, a lock stitch, even by accident, and it drops below your stitch plate, it's not, it doesn't land in fabric, it could get stuck in your hook. Because remember how close all those parts are? We studied that last week. And if, if your hook spins and it gets jammed in there, then you're going to get a, a reminder on your screen that looks like a set of gears. And it, it's telling you that you got something stuck in your hook. And a lot of times, this is what has just happened. And so what you gotta do, right? You gotta take your stitch plate off, you gotta take your hook out, you gotta look for the thread that's underneath. Sometimes your thread breaks along the way. You know, it's a process and that's okay. It's just that you have to understand that sometimes it's what we do that causes that to happen. So if you have this turned off, what if when you drive off the end of the fabric and you touch your scissors, your um, thread cutter on the head of the machine, and what if there's a knot or a lock stitch, a securing stitch attached to your thread cutter? Again, the knot might get stuck. It doesn't always, but it could get stuck in your hook. So when you start your next stitch, and then you're going to get the same message that says, oh, you got your thread stuck in your hook better clean it up. So here's, here's what I'm gonna tell you. If you're a person who likes to start sewing off the edge of the fabric at the beginning of your stitch, come into the screen and turn it off so that you don't have that happen. Also, if you're a person who drives off the end and uses your thread cutter, you don't wanna have a knot attached to your thread cutter. Let me show you real quick where you would find that. This, but this um, icon here means I'm, I'm gonna program the buttons that are on the head of my machine. 
So see all these buttons over here and the ones down here? You, those are programmable on some of these machines. And so if I go into here and I select the scissors here over on the left, so your thread cutter, then I can tell the machine that I want this turned on. And this means I'm going to do all uh, knots all in one spot. This means I can do a running stitch. Uh, it goes down to four and up to six. But if you have it turned off, when you sew and you touch your thread cutter, then it won't give you a lock stitch. Personally, I like to program my machine so that I can choose as I go. Some people like to program it so it always does the same thing every time. Completely up to you. Okay, let me check my list. The next thing we're going to talk about are a couple of stitches that are fun. So I'm going to choose stitch number 414. And this is a fun little um, satin stitch. And I'm going to go into my eye for information icon. Under the information is where you can kind of fine tune what your stitches might do. So I can choose to uh, touch pattern repeat, which is this icon right here, which means I can go up to nine repeats. The machine will give me how many repeats I've chosen here so that whenever I start sewing these out, it counts it down for me so I know I'm close to the end. If I want to shut that off, I just press and hold and it will shut off and now I'm in continuous sewing. There are two machines we have actually that when you touch this icon, it gives you a um, keypad and you can type in um, up to 99 and you can type in two digits. So just so you know, those are the 570 and the 590 uh, new models that um, can do that. This also has mirror image both directions. So these are on off buttons. So you can see this, the stitches flip. Um, sometimes it's, honestly, it, sometimes it's obvious what happens and sometimes if your stitch is rather symmetrical, you might not be able to tell. This icon right here is called multi-directional sewing. Now, <clears throat> this is super fun. It's highly creative and you can use it in all sorts of ways. And let me tell you what it does. When you select that icon, you can sew in any direction your heart desires, any direction. 720 different directions. And why would I want to do that? Um, for me, mostly for the fun of it, but there are functional reasons too. So let me show you how it works. I can tap the screen on these nodes and you can see my stitch moving around. So it would go an unusual direction like that, right? So if you were holding your fabric square to the table and it was set like this, the fabric would move in a direction to create the stitch going at 135 degrees from center. You can also turn your stitch length and width knobs like this, and you can see down here the stitch is uh, changing direction, and you look at the screen on the left and you can see how it's, it's moving on the screen. So this can be really fun because you can turn your stitch length and width knobs as you're sewing. I know, who would do that? Me, it's super fun. Uh, the creative side of this is just amazing. So I've done things like, um, I've done quilting, stippling with this feature with a straight stitch and a stitch length of three just by turning my stitch length and width knobs. And I can, the cool thing is your feed dogs are still up. So there's more control there. I'm not a great free motion stitcher. And so sometimes I wanna do something that's like fake free motion. And that's one way we can do that. It's also interesting to do things like this for, um, I don't know, military patches or Boy Scout patches. You can do, stitch in the ditch with a serpentine stitch, and then you don't have to turn your whole quilt around. Uh, crazy patch quilting, you can do, um, uh, put bag straps on with the X in the box stitch that you can never turn your fabric around far enough because your free arm gets in the way. 
So there are lots of reasons why multi-directional stitching, because that's what it's called, is super fun. This uh, feature is only available on the two machines that can do that sideways motion thing. Then that is the 790 and the, and the 880. And as I say that, because uh, we talked about feed dogs last week, right? So the feed dogs, as you know, I said to you last week, they move in the shape of a box and they go front to back, front to back, front to back, unless you hit reverse and then they go back to front, back to front, except for these two machines. On these two machines, 790 and 880, the feed dogs have an extra motor attached to them. And so they do move sideways and different directions, which seems not intuitive at all, but yet it's a thing and it's super fun. I do have a um, project on the We Also blog that explains a little more detail about this particular feature, and it, it's really fun. I have a picture um, to show you. Debbie, Jeannie yes. here for a sec. Doesn't sure. our 830 also have directional sewing? The 830 prior to our 880 that took its place. So don't forget about that pretty little machine too. And I, you know what? I think um, I think the 730 also did this. Yes, it did. The Artista 730. Yes, ma'am, it did. Thank you, Debbie. Yep. Mm -hmm. There, Thank there you. are several of the machines that are not in the line anymore that that also did this feature. But it is um, amazing fun. So let's see. What else did I want to show you? Uh, one more thing here. I want to show you um, a feature called connecting stitches. And the way this works is this. If I choose a stitch, let me find my stitch. <clears throat> Oops, so I went one page too far. Here it is. So when you go into combination mode, and that's the plus sign at the bottom of your screen, and when you turn it on, it, it like gives you a whole different view because now I have a bar down the middle where stitches will line up. I can choose decorative stitches, I can choose numbers, I can choose letters, I can write words, I can do labels, I can do you know someone's name and put pretty stitches at each end, all, all sorts of things in here. So the cool thing is that whenever I'm on um, a 790 or an 880, these two machines have a feature down here with this double arrow. Well, not all machines have this feature, but you can actually change how a how a stitch will will sew out. Let me show you what I mean. So if I, it's easier on a machine than it is on a computer. Just saying. So see how these see how these stitches now are not in a straight line. They now jump left and right. And it's it's a lot of fun to watch when this happens because it'll sew one stitch and when it goes to do the next one, it'll dance to the left or dance to the right and sew the next stitch, which is um, a, a lot of fun and very, very creative. And this uh, plus sign is an on off button. So a lot of our a lot of our machines have combination modes. Uh, that you can connect all these different stitches together all the way down into the three series. And so you'll need to practice those because those are a lot of fun to do as well. Let's see, I think that's all I had on my list for this. So let me get my PowerPoint back up here and we'll work through the rest. Okay, so this is another creative option that I didn't go into on the simulator, but you can take a regular stitch and change it into a triple stitch. You can do this on a 790 and 880 under the um, stitch designer, or you can also do it on a 590 or a 570 and that would be under the information icon, there's um, one icon that is uh, called a triple stitch. And you can take any stitch and do this. Now, what I would recommend is that you use stitches that are not 
already somehow have a satin stitch portion. Because a triple stitch literally goes over top of the same stitch three times. And if you had a satin stitch that was already a tight stitch and added more, it could, you know, not look great. The next one is uh, the connecting stitches one. I used a different stitch in this picture, but you can see that I took a regular stitch and then stitched it by just um, moving the stitch left and right. There's so many creative things in these machines. All of them have options for um, changing lengths and widths and all different things. And that's, you need to experience what's in your machine. Don't, don't limit yourself to just, um, you know, the usual. Let's step outside the box and, and, and try something new. Uh, this is a picture of that multi-directional sewing project. It's on the We All Sew blog, weallsew.com. Go into the search key at the top right and just type in the word multi-directional. And you'll see the directions on how to do multi-directional stitching. And all I did was take a bag pattern that I liked and then I changed it because I, I think a pattern is a mere suggestion on how things should be done. I like to kind of create my own stuff and try something new, kind of push the limits, make sure that you um, try stuff that you wouldn't have necessarily even considered. But I have no problem if you ask yourself, I wonder what would happen if I did this? It's probably fine and you should try to see what else you can create. So this bag pattern actually didn't have a pocket in it, but I added the pocket on the outside, which is where the flower pot bottom is. And then all those decorative stitches you see coming out of the top that are on the base of the bag, those are all using multi-directional sewing. That's how they got there. I did not turn my fabric when I did it. I just held them square to the table and the stitch is what turned direction, not the fabric. And I have to tell you, lots of fun. Oh, Jeannie, we're gonna talk about cleaning your sewing machine. Would you put up a poll question for me? Miss Debbie, it would be my absolute pleasure. So here we go, folks, watch your screens. We have a question being launched right now. Do you see it? Do you see it? We'd like to know how often you currently clean and oil your sewing machine. Simply enough, when it makes that horrible grinding noise, I don't like that. After every two or three full bobbins, every day, or perhaps with every project. We're not allowed to vote, but I'm watching your, oh my gosh, it's coming in fast, Debbie, coming in quickly. I'm watching your answers scroll across my screen and here just in a moment. See, Debbie can't see this, only I can see what you're answering right now. So, gosh. Are you having a good time yet? Isn't this amazing information? Oh my gosh, to sit here and not have my machine in front of me to be able to do these great creative things. While we're finishing with the poll, just wanna remind you folks, if you may have missed the um, stitch part one, don't worry, go to the Bernina website, learn and create. Once you open that drop down menu, look for classes. All of our webinars that we've had are going to be archived under webinar recordings. So follow the prompts. I believe it's classes, recorded webinars, sewing, but you will find the part one to this wonderful presentation right there on the Bernina website. And for those who are looking forward to getting more information today, you'll receive a link to watch this webinar again. All right, we are just about there, Debbie. I'm going to close the poll. I think I'm not seeing any. Oh, I saw a couple more changes. Maybe 10 more seconds and we'll close it out. This is a fast 10 seconds. Three, two, one, and it's closed. So now let me share your results. Oh my gosh. So only 8% of you said when the machine makes the grinding noise. That's a good thing, guys. <laughs> 38%, oh, Debbie, they must have taken your class. 38% said after every two to three full bobbins. 17% said every day. 
and 37 said with every project. So I think they've taken your classes before or else they've taken the class that you've taught the dealer to teach their students. They all know well. So thank you. I'm going to take myself off and let you proceed forward, Deb. Thank you, Jeannie. And My thank pleasure. You. Thanks for all for joining. <laughs> Thank you everyone for answering the question. This is very interesting to me. I, um, I have this thing about, you know, making sure machines are clean because that's what makes your stitches look better. And let me, um, we'll go through some things. So first of all, uh, the technicians in Chicago advise that you should clean and oil your machine every other full bobbin for those of you who have the jumbo bobbins. So that's eight series, seven series, five series, and four series. And um, and that would be the eight, eight, the older 830 as well. Every third full bobbin for standard size bobbins. So that would be uh, any of our other older machines like this uh, Artista machines, the Activa machines, our current uh, three series machine, the 215. Uh, all of those are a standard size bobbin. And every third full bobbin is when you clean and oil your machine. We do not recommend that you use canned air because that blows the uh, dirt and the fuzz and the whatever into the machine rather than pulling it out. We advise that you use a vacuum attachment that you can attach to your regular um, home vacuum and uh, you can get those at your local Bernina dealer. You should remove your stitch plate and uh, use the little brush that comes with the machine and dust out all the thread bits and dust that you see under there. For those of you that can take the hook out of the machine and oil the machine, you should take it out and oil the machine. The 8 series, the 830, the 880, you do not take the hook out. And also on the 200 or the 730, you also do not take the hook out of those machines or the 640, I think, also is one that you don't take the hook out. Uh, those rotary hook machines, you don't take the hooks out. Uh, you would have to look in your manual and see um, or talk to your dealer and make sure you know where to um, oil those machines. But I, I stole this picture from Hans. He's our technician in Chicago. He shows this to our new dealers when I do training for them when I go to Chicago. And you can see to uh, in this picture to the left of that red vertical line, you'll see that you can see the bobbin and it looks pretty clean over there. But when you take the whole uh, the case off the machine, you can see all the fuzz and the dust that happens inside a machine. And, and you know, this um, prevents your machine from uh, working well. Your, um, there, there are, you know, I think I mentioned this last week, there are almost a thousand moving parts in some of our higher end machines. And you have to understand that you, things don't move well if they're covered in, you know, fuzz and dust like that. So what can happen is something like you see in this picture here, and this is actually an embroidery um, alphabet letter, and you can see this is the back side of the fabric, and the 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 stitching looks really horrible. It can cause your you know um, things to just not work well at all because things are not oiled. So this is another view of similar things on the left hand side. You can see how the stitching looks like not right, it should be pretty even uh, across the stitch. And uh, all the technicians did to solve this problem was hook cleaning and, oil and lubricating. On your uh, B880 or 830, this is where you would oil your, your machine. You don't take the hook out of these machines. You um, rotate the hook to the correct position and then you drop one drop of oil right behind um, the whole mechanism. And this is actually a screen capture from YouTube. So if you went to YouTube uh, and into the Bernina channel and search for B880 oil, machine oils, um, it, it would give you this um, couple minute video on how to uh, clean and oil your 880. And I'm Debbie. sure you Yes. 
I wanted to add something that you taught me. I'm not sure if you're going to inject this. Forgive me for jumping in, but one of the things you taught me was to take that bobbin out of it when you're oiling and do not put that bobbin back in until you receipt your bobbin basket. Is that still correct? So the bobbin stays away until you clean oil, close it, reseat it, and then you put the bobbin back in. Is that right still? That, that is correct. Because okay, when thank you. Yes, when you um, clean an oil in 880, you open the bobbin door, you take the bobbin out, out the bobbin, the bobbin um, out of the machine, and you have to uh, rotate the hook so that you can oil in this position that you see on the screen. If you try to put your bobbin back in when your hook is not in the correct position, it won't sew right straight up. So you have to close the door without a bobbin in it it'll reset the uh, hook to the correct position then you open the door again and then you put your bobbin in on the seven series five series four series machines it's a different um, mechanism so it's a completely different it's a different hook system uh, these screen captures i want you to know i got off of the machine itself okay there's a um, tutorial in the machine that shows you where to oil your machine so i uh, grab these off of off of there and this the picture that you see here shows one drop of oil at the bottom of the hook race so you see the back that's the uh, back side of the where the hook would sit in you have at this point that you see you have taken the bobbin and the bobbin case out and you've taken open the door the black circle door, and you would grab the in the post of the hook and lift it out of the machine and set it aside. And then you would dust this on the inside and you would drop one drop of oil where you see that drop of oil showing up right there. Okay. That that is important because the that is a metal part and your hook is a metal part. And when you seat the two together, the hook is going to spin and when that hook spins it's spinning metal against metal and you have to have some kind of lubricant in there that would um, um, keep them moving smoothly if your machine is making those grindy noises or sounding loud then she's thirsty give her a drink you don't have to wait until it's been two two bobbin changes if you've been sewing a lot then you know it's fine also no just be aware, those of you in drier climates, um, Arizona, Nevada, Southern California, places where it's very dry, um, the drier air help, uh, causes the oil to evaporate faster. And uh, I know this for a fact, uh, we, we had an event in um, Arizona several years back and we had to oil the 880 machines pretty often, several after every class that we had, every couple hours we had to oil them because the air was so dry that the oil and the oil that we use for these machines is a light oil because they're high speed machines. And so we had to oil them more often because of the uh, evaporation factor. So just so you know that that's a thing. Okay, sorry, back to this. Um, this seven series, five series, four series, you start by taking the hook out, cleaning this out, putting one drop of oil. Then you take your hook and on the inside of the hook, you'll see two little spots, one on each side of the center post, and you will drop one drop of oil on each of those. There is no place else on these machines that you ever need to oil, just those two spots within the hook and at the hook race, you put the whole mechanism back together and um, it should, she should sing for you from there. So we're wrapping up our webinar. Fine tune your stitches. Use your machine to make your stitches do what you want them to do. Be discerning. Take a look at it. Do some testing. See what makes you happy. This is all about the fun. This is not work. This is fun. So how can you change your settings to make a stitch look the way you prefer? Are you using the right presser foot for the job at hand? Are you keeping your machine nice and clean so that your stitches look nice and pretty? So I encourage you to test sew, 
study, learn, practice. I give you permission to try new things. Um, don't hold back, right? If you make a mistake, uh, that's all right. It's just a sewing project, we can redo it. So I encourage you to learn, to sew and create because it's a journey and we're allowed to go on the journey and enjoy every step of the way. So I hope you've enjoyed and learned a few things today. And um, Jeannie, let's, yes, have, let's have a few questions. My pleasure. And Debbie has taught me to enjoy the journey every stitch of the way too. So one of the first questions that came repeatedly was, could you share the difference between the cut stitch plate and the zero millimeter plate? Is there, is there, are they one of the same? Can you use the straight stitch with the cut? Can you use the cut with the straight stitch? I, I believe they are interchangeable. They are. They, I, I, um, I think originally when the cut work plate came out years ago, it, it had a little bit different size hole than the straight stitch plate, and that's why there were two. So some machine, some of you do have both, one or the other, uh, but they are interchangeable. I typically use the cut work plate when I'm setting up my machine for straight stitch. As Debbie said, before the cut work ever came out, the straight stitch was separate. So now they've made it easy for all of us. All yes. righty. Where can they buy the big book of feet from your local Bernina dealer? We do not sell to other outside sources. It's just provided for our dealerships on our website. If you've come to join us and you don't already know of your Bernina home, you can go to our website and locate your dealer right at the top of those prompts. So as I mentioned earlier, don't forget to go check for the previous webinars. Now, Debbie, we have some questions. If you would be so kind as to get out your simulator again, sure. they would like for you to show where to adjust the speed of the dual feed, which is only available on the B880, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I need where to grab it. Yep, let me grab okay. a different simulator here. Hold on. Thank you. Yep, yep. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, so if you are um, sewing a um, piecing, for example, you might change your stitch length, you might change your presser foot pressure. But to change your dual feed, first thing you would do is you would attach your dual feed foot. So I can go into here and I can choose my number one D foot like this. So I can tell the machine which foot I'm using. Not, you can't tell every machine which foot you're using. Um, so let me let me speak to that before I move to the uh, dual feed speed. There are four machines that you can tell the machine exactly what foot you're going to use. And yes, that's an additional security function on those machines. So that would be 880, 790, the 590, and the 570. Okay. The rest of the machines have a um, presser foot recommendation but you really can't tell the machine which foot you're using. But the feet have a, um, some of the feet have that, I call it a crystal, uh, that's really not what it's called. They're, um, they're coat, coated. Coated feet. So Sensors. on the, yes. So they have, uh, they have, they have the um, code on the top that is read by um, the machine. When you put it on the machine, the machine can read what the code says. And so some of those codes mean it's a nine millimeter wide foot. And some of those mean that it's a dual feed foot. So the machines kind of read by groups what foot you might have on just by that much, but there are only four that you can actually use it as a security function. Okay, so I I'm gonna use my dual feed foot and I go into my eye for information to change my speed of my dual feed. And I would push up here like this on the information icon box. And you'll see this icon down here at the bottom. It's kind of hidden unless you push up there on the side. And you'll see a picture of a dual feed in the back of the foot. So in here is where you can change the speed. So here's, here's the way I look at this. Um, if I'm using the best explanation I've come up with, it, let's say I'm putting Minky to cotton, and I know you're all just groaning out there because, you know, that's a, like, uh, Minky to cotton, 
So if I put my minky on the top, minky's very stretchy, and I am using my dual feed foot, and I want to um, speed it up because if the top fabric is stretchy, then I need to pull that pull that fabric a little faster than my lower feed dogs. And to do that, I move this up to a positive number here. Okay, let's say I flip it over. Now I have my minky on the bottom and my cotton on the top. So my, my minky is the stretchier one and the feed dogs are pulling it, but I can slow down my dual feed foot to help keep the two pieces even. So then I would make this a negative number. So it kind of all depends on if your fabric on the top is stretchier, then you move to a positive number. If your fabric on the bottom is stretchier, then you move to a negative number. And how do you know where to set it in this range? Test so. That's the only way you know the answer. So, and, and it uh, honestly, if you match this feature or dual feed in general with presser foot pressure, dual feed plus presser foot pressure are two magic features that go together. They are amazing for making sure that your your um, points match on your quilt. Like I would, I would use this when I was piecing, and I would move this because you know cotton fabric stretches, especially if you're doing um, half square triangles or anything on a bias. Oh, you know, so use your dual feed, use your presser foot pressure, turn that down so there's less stretching. Those two things together are like the magic in my world. I, uh, I test and adjust these every time I sew, depending on the fabric needle thread I'm using today. I hope that makes sense. Yes, just maybe one or two more questions as we're wrapping things up, but there was one on Debbie. Did you set fake free motion quilting using the multi directional sewing and she yeah. has an she has a 475 QE. 475. OK, so the 475 does not have the multi directional function, but. What I would tell her to use if she wants to do fake free motion. The easiest way for you to do that on a 475 would be to get the leather roller foot. Yes, ma'am. And I don't have any um, examples. I don't have any pictures of, of um, I can show you, I can show you a picture of it uh, from in here. Number That's 50. foot number 55. Yep. So the foot looks like this. Okay. It looks like uh, when you put it on your machine, it, it, there's, there's a wheel about well, an inch and a quarter. I guess at a slant and it sits to the left of your needle and the and what you would do is you would move your needle to the toward to the left so it lines up pretty closely to your foot just make sure you're clearing it okay you don't want to you know hit the needle to the foot and this foot was created by Bernina mm -hmm. um, and this is a story that I I think is true uh, maybe Jeannie knows for sure <laughs> what I've always heard is that a French glove company yes asked for Nina to make them make them a foot in which they could um, have the machine go around the fingers of the gloves without teaching their people how to do it by free motion and this is the leather roller foot correct it attaches in just such a small space to the I call it my free motion quilting foot my my training wheels touches in just a small space on that feed dog to contact you can turn on a dime. Oh, oh, yeah. You are right, Debbie. Yep, and she, she could also use their straight stitch foot and uh, yeah. straight stitch plate. Straight no, stitch no, 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 no. You cannot use a straight stitch plate with this. You change oh, your needle position. That's right. You can't. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't go there, folks. <laughs> All righty. Um, just a couple more things. Difficult to get all the lint out. Um, the weight of the lighter oil. Your lighter machines with faster speeds require a lighter velocite oil weight. You don't mm -hmm. want to mix up those road the his hook system, say of a of a three series or an older four or five that has a CB hook. You want to keep your weights of oil different. But Deb, they're just saying 
there's the attachment that you see in the computer stores with the small little nozzle that attaches to the end of your sewing machine. Or excuse me, your your what's it called? A vacuum. I'm, I'm, what are, are those really part of your? I'm sorry, my husband does that. <laughs> um, but yes, you just get those very carefully, or take an old paper towel roll, gently position it and kind of squish it at the end. You can slip that over the tube of your nozzle, but be careful. You do not want to suck so hard that you could hurt your machine, but just gently pulling some of those extra fuzz bunnies out of the, um, what was it? And then somebody said, can you, can't you talk about those little fuzz bunnies that fall behind the bobbin? Yeah. Those yeah. are not fun either. But no. uh, I think we're kind of, ra oh, why aren't pre and bobbins suggested for Berninas? Well, um, because a Bernina is made to um, very specific um, specifications. And if you tr if you used a um, pre-wound like paper bobbin, uh, number one, it would probably kick off any bobbin sensors if your machine had that and, because it can't see through them to read the bobbin. And if your machine doesn't have a bobbin sensor, then your stitches probably would not look very nice. Um, uh -huh. they, they, they are a certain size with certain, um, certain um, ways that they're made so that they work for a precision high-end um, um, machine. Even if it's a three series, those are still the mechanics inside of a smaller Bernina, a three series, a four series, all of those things that we talked about last week and this week are made the same way as they are on our uh, top of the line machines. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between the quality of the metal or the uh, or how they're built. They're, it's, it's the same across the whole line. So if you want precision stitches, you don't want to use a pre-wound. It's not <laughs> wind a bobbin. So. Mm -hmm. And as Debbie says, you become so attuned to your machine. You dance with it. It's a courting game almost as you become to know it. You hear the sounds when it's dry, when it's thirsty. So become used to what your machine, if you don't need to oil it that often, you don't need to. If it's speaking to you, just listen. It's like a child who wants attention. <laughs> okay. And Debbie? rave reviews great webinar thank you we want more of these they do want the bernina app back we'll i will pass that on that wonderful little yeah. um features card we'll pass that on but thank okay. you everyone have a lovely holiday weekend debbie yes. you're tremendous thank you so much thank you Jeannie. thank you everyone for coming and have a great holiday weekend bye bye y'all bye